first item. Said there any apologies. Wait. Afternoon, Chairman. Apologies from Councillor Collins, and we're missing Councillors Brody and Dean Struthers. Court yeah. session at the moment. Well, they're here. Well, no. <laughs> I was given the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Is there any uh, de declarations of interest? No. Uh, minutes of the meeting of 6th of May. Move them as a correct record, sir. And go on to item, item 4, view of standing orders and scheme of delegation. Uh, there's a number of issues here with regard to standing orders. We made some recommendations earlier on in the year. They were agreed by the full council. There was one or two small issues that we were asked to take back and have a look at, and we've got the report here. And anything you want to add to the report, Derek? Nothing to add, Chairman. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Any queries? Ivor? Just with regard to the seminar at C14 for the audit and risks, um, do we need to put that into minutes to make sure it comes back? There was concern from the Chair that it might be six months if we just don't have it in the actual recommendation. Certainly more than happy to go with members' preference, but I'm certainly clear that there's a seminar scheduled for the 2nd of December uh, at the uh, conclusion of the next Audit and Risk Management Committee, and it will then be uh, following that seminar that the recommendations come forward to the next meeting of the Audit and Risk, and it's a case of whether they come straight here or uh, go straight to full council. Clearly, in the, minute, in the, the decision today, you may wish to note that uh, you will also receive further recommendations from the Audit and Risk Management Committee. Happy to incorporate that in the minutes, uh, Chairman. Happy that, Ivor. Sorry, it, it was a question you know, on, the, on the basis of your, your, your asking for questions, sir. 2.5, the recommendation there. Chair, bear in mind that there are other quasi judicial forums uh, in the, you know, the Council, I'm thinking of Planning Applications Committee, licensing panels, etc. Uh, should we maybe not be uh, thinking to be consistent? and incorporating a similar provision in relation to these. Uh, you know, I'm flagging it up, sir. Obviously, you might wish to leave it until we come to the decision of that particular, or the consideration of that particular issue. But it seems to me there'd be consistency and logic in doing that, Chair. I would tend to agree, but I'd maybe prefer it for officers to take away and have a look. So I, thought, I think the trouble with it, that this particular one, uh, as you well know, the employment appeals, you sit in there for four or five hours. It's absolutely pointless, a member coming in, I mean, it happened to me actually. The meeting went on so long that I had another appointment, I had to leave. So there's no way I would, I would ever have come back. But I think it's happened where somebody has uh, come in, left, and then felt they could come back in at a later stage. But it's one of these things, if you're sitting there in judgment, there is no way you're going to leave a meeting and not hear the whole evidence. And I think that's equally true of planning. Although they, they, you're talking maybe an individual application, if somebody comes in late, uh, or somebody leaves and then comes back in during the hearing. In fairness, most members who do that do tend to uh, abstain if it goes to a vote, but I think you're probably right, you need to enshrine that. We've got a similar situation with uh, liquor, well, non-liquor licensing, which is under our control. It's a similar type of thing there because you're making a decision. So, Would you be happy for officers just to take a look at it? Well, well content with that, sir. I'm grateful to you. Thank you. Is there any further uh, queries? Could you just say on that one? Maybe, maybe another thing needs to be tidied up. I mean, talking about planning there, Alistair. We have the local review bodies. Now, it is the uh, it's statute. If, you, if, if people don't attend the, a site visit, they can't take part in the rest of the process. Perhaps we need to look, look at extending that to the, the actual full planning committee. It seems to be an anomaly there where in one part of a planning process, members must be in attendance at a site visit before they can make a decision. Yet in another one, half the committee can't, don't, don't turn up, yet they can take part in the decision-making process. So I think we maybe need to take, we'll take a look at that one as well, the site visit uh, scenario. It does seem to be incongruous. Thanks very much. Any other questions on the recommendations here? Ian? Apologies for lateness. He's picking up that particular point on employment appeal. Just some answer to the clue, uh, officer, I've read this. What we're agreeing to do in regards to, is it 2.5 you're talking about, or what, what one is it? 
Was it a particular recommendation you were talking about? Was it I 2.5? Does that refer to just where it's uh, the employment appeals, where it's uh, the, the appeals process against the, a disciplinary? It doesn't it because sometimes we're looking at uh, looking at uh, different again whether it's sh shaping the again the I'm trying to think what, what the proper wording is for it. It's not just d discipline that we look at it. It's other, the other aspects of employment appeals, and that wouldn't necessarily I wouldn't have thought would apply. I think it says that within the, within the report. But sorry, apologies for lateness. I would have, I would have had it looked up before I got started. I just got caught up in, an, in another meeting. But does that are, you, are we applying that to all the employment appeals committees or just certain ones? Because some are far more you could say quasi judi judicial than others. Well, I mean, employment appeals is three uh, remits. You've got the one you've mentioned, which is the uh, disciplinary side. And I think it's incumbent that all members must be present throughout the whole of that process. It seems to be fair. The other one is obviously the uh, employment process, because we are the employment committee as well. And in the case of uh, directors, it'll be the entire committee that meets. So that'll be the whole 19, that's the only time the whole 19 members, at one instance, the whole 19 members would be present. So if you're making an appointment, the same thing must apply there. You can't sit there, have four candidates coming before you, and somebody walks out when they're interviewing the third candidate and then still participates. So in those two instances, that would have to be the rule. The only other time the committee would meet, we'd be looking at the... Uh, I think we've got the remit to, to look at employment and uh, a fuels policy. Uh, or perhaps if there's any changes to the law, we'd be the appropriate committee to comment on it. So in that case, then I would suggest that that power doesn't have to apply. But Alistair, you want to come in that one? When you're finished. Well, okay, you know, I, I think, you know, uh, the, the suggestions that you made and, you know, sort of the other issues have been brought up are eminently sensible. And apart from anything else, Chair, uh, it does not thereupon leave us open to making policy in the hoof today. I think, you know, we should remit these other issues. The potential anomalies, I'll put it no higher than that at this stage. Uh, get the report back and proceed as a cause thereafter. Thank you. Yeah, it was the third day. It was when looking at uh, job descriptions, terms and conditions, stuff like that. It was the first year. I totally agree. For having an interview, so we're interviewing a, um, a potential member of staff or a member of staff for a job, absolutely should be. If you're there at the beginning, you've got to be there at the end. Or if it's a discipline appeal against dismissal and such, like, absolutely should be there right through. But it's only the third aspect I was talking about. Chair, it was just on 2.1. Current practices that we don't record. Now, is that a ballot or the result of the ballot? You know, do you put in that there was a ballot held? Because we've been asked to look at this. I personally think we should maintain the status quo rather than move to. But what you would record is a ballot was held, and because there's a three uh, points that you decide on. So if there is a division, all we say is a ballot was held and the decision was. Do not record what the vote was. You do not record who voted which way. Uh, that's best practice. You would record the ballot took place and the decision was. You don't identify either the score or who voted which way. Uh, it, I mean, it's quite possible that uh, you know, three members, it could be three members who were present and you could say it was the ballot took place and it was 2-1. Uh, so you're almost identifying people there. My understanding, you don't actually record just now that a ballot has taken place. All that you actually record is that the grounds agreed at the end was the grounds of appeal were either not substantiated, substantiated, or substantiated in part. No reference to a ballot. Now, my understanding, that's the current practice. Um, we had been asked to look whether we actually take there was a ballot, and now I would stick with the status quo. Well, it'll come as no surprise, Chair, that, uh, you know, to, to, to hear me say that I, I don't agree with that because I've been one of those that, you know, have banged in this particular drum for some time. You know, we do talk often, and rightly so, about transparency. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, it does no harm, you know, to make it abundantly clear that a ballot took place. Because, you know, that way, uh, if you don't do that, you're creating the impression, you know, that uh, the decision was unanimous. Uh, now, I would may, uh, maybe I've revised my judgment somewhat uh, since the EEI committee earlier in the week when Councillor Forster made reference to the fact that uh, 
well, the Wigney Area Committee agreement was predicated in a 4-3 vote with one abstention. Uh, <laughs> The, there is, the, the blunt fact of the matter is that it doesn't no matter whether it's the chairman's cast and vote or whatever. Uh, the decision is the decision, and you respect it and, and, and on that basis. But I can I say that when it actually when it comes to appointments or appeals, there can be no cast and vote by the chairman. Um, so the, the, the vote must be a decisive vote one way or another. If you're going to appoint a director, if you're going to uh, sack someone, you can't have a you can't have a three-three draw and the chairman have a cast and vote. So. Uh, that's it. I mean, you've got, you've got to remember, we, we got QC's advice on this a number of years ago. The former convener, he was a minority, I think 6 1 at the committee, on a certain issue. It was people from his hometown, and he wanted, to make, he wanted his dissent to be recorded so he put their Kent that uh, he was in support of what they wanted. Now, it had never been the practice before. Quite right, also, we got government's advice, wasn't content with that. We took QC's advice. And that was the advice that, I mean, custom practice before that has been backed up by QC's advice that uh, people should not identify. Because at the end, if somebody wants to record their dissent, that they didn't think somebody could, that they thought uh, certain employees should have had a wage rise, that's one thing. But you can also say that uh, that, that, would then allow an, that would then allow a councillor to record his dissent because he didn't like the appointment of the chief executive. Now that, the chief executive would come along because it meant so. Councillor Smith didn't uh, think I was the right man for the job. I'll bear that in mind for the future. So it's also to protect the members if you think about it. Um, anyway, Colin? I wouldn't have a problem with having my dissent recorded. <laughs> but, um, so, so basically what we're just... I, I don't sit in, 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 in the Employment Appeals Subcommittee, so forgive my ignorance on this, but when, when you go to a vote, um, when, when we have a vote at a, a council meeting, you need a proposer and a seconder. But do you need that employment? You just simply go straight to the vote, if, or do you actually, do you actually, you know, if if you go with the effectively a dismissal, do you actually just have a vote and it could be three one? You don't actually need a seconder or anything like that at the, 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 the committee, do you? Well, well you've got the three, you've got the three options. So some somebody technical could move that the appeal is upheld, etc. Somebody could second that. Somebody else could move. Uh, an alternative. Now, if they didn't get a seconder, like an, ordin an ordinary committee, now, if you do get a seconder, you can record your dissent. What but we're saying in this case is that dissent can't be recorded because that identifies the individual member of the committee. But, but therefore, what you would also, so it wouldn't really tackle the problem by saying you, you, you insert the word ballot because actually, if, an in, if only one member was an, of the opposing view, there wouldn't be a ballot. Therefore, it, it, it would not. The amendment we're being suggested here wouldn't actually pick up. Oh, the no, initial no, point was well, how do you record the fact that one member might be against could, it? You know, if that person got a seconder, then. But if they didn't get a seconder, then the fact they were against it wouldn't be recorded at all. The, the, then, if you got a second, if you got a seconder, you proceed to a, to a vote, so then you would have a ballot. But bear in mind, it's also a ballot by uh, lot. It's not a ballot by uh, roll call. You know, if you're at any appointment or uh, dismissal by secret ballot, right? So again, that meant against, against them be recording their dissent because if it's a secret ballot, it's going to record dissent or a decision. But you, you, you wouldn't have a ballot if there wasn't more if there was if there was more one person actually asking, uh, giving an opposing view. So, so if you have an example where you've got five members, four of them are in favour of one decision and one is against, you wouldn't record in here anything. Um, if five were in favour and zero against, you wouldn't record anything. But if three were in favour and two were against. You would record that as a ballot, you know. So you're not really distinguishing between the five zero and the four one vote, are you? That's that's the issue because we wouldn't have a vote with only one person going against it. So I think that it seems to me that the kind of point that was being made from full council was you ha an individual having the right to record a dissent. So in certain the word ballot doesn't really tackle that. It does distinguish between a three two result and a a five nothing result, but it doesn't distinguish between a three two result and a four one result, does it?
that, that's it in a nutshell, sir. Uh, summed up succinctly as always, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, you know, I would want to see it amended, you know, to make reference to the fact that ballot took place and the following decision was reached. Here, if you go in that ground, what was the ballot that actually took place? Was it seen uh, substantiated, not substantiated, partially substantiated? And it might affect the person going forward to appeal against you know, an industrial tribunal, is it after it's been appealed to the council? whether it was in part or whether it was fully substantiated again, not substantiated. Okay. The decision that was either the appeal was missed or upheld. But I've, I've got to be honest and say, Chair, that, that that is part of my reason that, you know, there, there should be, you know, at, at the end of the day, if, if a person, you know, who feels aggrieved about the decision wishes to take it further, I think it's helpful and it's in the interest of natural justice that that person should know, in fact, that that decision was not taken unanimously. If there was a ballot, if there was a divergence of opinion, at the end of the day, he or she is entitled to know that uh, and, and it might, you know, assist uh, the individual concerned uh, in determining whether or not they wish to take it you know, further to the likes of a tribunal, etc. I don't know, but, there, you know, it's certainly a possibility. And to me, you know, from the point of view of principle, you know, it's a lack of transparency if you doctor it in such a way that you're not admitting that a ballot that there was a divergence among the members. I, mean, I would tend to agree with you because when I think you go to the other side of appointments, when we appoint people, again, that's a secret ballot. You know, the full council we appoint the chief executive, all 47 members present, and uh, basically all we do then is write down the name of the person we think should be chief executive. That, that goes in, and it is recorded after a ballot. Joe Smith is appointed as the chief exec. So I would, I would tend to agree with you. Would you, would you go along with that, uh, Ivor? Because it gives us consistency both for appointments and dismissals, I think. I think that was a good point. Because it doesn't identify individual members. If there was a ballot, is it? Say there was a ballot and it was the ballot came out in favour of not substantiated, whereas it was actually a three two vote on partially substantiated and not uh, substantiated. And the person wouldn't know whether it was partial or full as the other one, so they might think, Well, if it's fully substantiated, therefore I might go for tribunal, partial I might not. No, but are you really arguing for the status quo, or are you want to actually take it further and say a ballot took place between A and B? Because that's even further than Alistair uh, going. I think it's cleaner to not have the ballot in there. That's my personal preference, but if you want the ballot in, it's just if it, it would cause problems further down the line by having that in there. I mean, I, I think, thinking about it, uh, I don't see any reasons why not to have it in, why to say again that there was a ballot, but that's as far as it would go to say that it wasn't a, a meeting of minds. Okay, and it's as simple as that. That's all you're displaying is that on balance some folk were thinking one, one way and some folk were thinking another. I didn't really see what implications that would have, any great implications if it was to be taken to a, a, an employment tribunal after that. Again, if I was looking at an employment tribunal, what the previous decision, how it got to that, wouldn't have, wouldn't have much cognizance of that. So I would support Alistair on that. Yeah, in the interest of transparency, I support the ballot, the fact that ballots took place to move forward. Anybody in favour of Ivor's motion? Well, I, Ivor's option is not Can to Can I have my record. dissent recorded? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll, consensus, we'll move to consensus or somewhere in here. Okay, we record, we record that a ballot took place. Because I didn't want to confuse you further, Ivor, because you actually think that there are seven folk present. So you could actually have all three options on the table. And uh, it's actually, what, what would then happen if you think about it, you have all three options on the table. So the person who didn't put anything forward or second anything, they would be identified as having the substantive vote at the end of the day. And two, 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 and the person who didn't say anything, they, they would have the, they, they'd make the third vote on the third option. So I'd be happy to call the ballot. Well, I think if that, that, that covers 2-1, that we recommend that there be a record 
the about has taken place. Um, two two. Recommend full council words where there is not a consensus and set at the beginning of plan order ten three two. And that is on. Is that another one? That's fine. Members happy with that? Uh, two, three, to retain the social work services subcommittee, subcommittee social work services, pending establishment of health and social care partnership body. Yep. Uh, retain the current report lines for housing subcommittee, pending review of the chief executive to shape of the council. Alistair? Yeah, I agree with that, sir. But what, you know, what sort of time scale are we talking about in relation to this? Because, I mean, that, 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 this is a different situation, I would suggest, from uh, 2.3. I think, Colin, can you remind us? The, the, apparently, there's a report coming to full council in December with the uh, proposals on the shape of the council. So at that point, we'll know effectively where council will sit. Subject and other words, chair, the 18th of December. Well, well, that's when, when the implementation happens is obviously a further, a further issue, but at the very least, by the time you get to December, you'll, you'll know where housing is going to sit, and at that point, you both, I think you both move quite easily and quickly after that to make a decision. We know where it sits at the moment, and there's an anomaly there, but obviously, but come December, we'll, we'll have a better understanding. Well content with that, sir. Thank you. Take that away and look at the various points that were raised aren't we, around planning, around review bodies, and also the difference between um, the three, the three uh, components of that committee as well. Oh, I wasn't quite clear, uh, you know, whether or not that was the decision. I, I was coming to the conclusion, so that we, we've agreed uh, that, insofar as relating to the employment appeals ah, subcommittee yeah. today, but uh, you know, the other possibilities, you know, would be taken away for a, for a, for a, for a, a further ah. report. There was three components to that, that that committee that we talked about, and we said that that, that amendment would be some would be for two of them, not for all three. Though, so if you're doing policy, members come and go, but when you're doing, um, for example, appointments and somebody's appeal, yeah. then that it only applies to those two. Is that what we're agreeing? I think we can tidy it up, full council, and say that uh, when the committee is in the business of making appointments or hearing appeals, then that, that applies and that, that tidies that up for that committee. And also take a look at how we tidy up the, the other semi semi judicial committees in the same manner. Yeah, thanks, Chairman. I think the, the intention of members is clear. Therefore, if you're happy, we can just insert that we delegate officers to uh, take the appropriate action. And rather than it come back to this subcommittee and delay things, I think members would want it to go straight to full council. But we're mindful of what uh, members view as it on on this is, and we'll, we'll incorporate that into the report to full council. So I think we'll have asked Derek maybe to say a few words on this one, if there's anything he wants to, to add. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, hopefully what you've got before you today, members, is the, the work that you asked us to look into. I think we've been uh, fairly clear in terms of the scheme to distinguish between decision maker and advisor. We're also giving members uh, uh, reaffirming the advice in terms of being careful in the role that you're performing. As we're saying also, to bear in mind uh, Declaring an interest uh, on occasions uh, will require you to make a, a judgment on whether or not you stay or leave uh, the meeting, but we're just reminding you that that will apply particularly when, in fact, you're a decision maker. And quite clearly, members are familiar uh, with that. And we're also uh, reassuring you that officers have been uh, given clear uh, indications from the, ourselves to put increased effort into assuring members that uh, these committees uh, are uh, very much got good governance in place. So link officers need to fulfill an assurance role. 
that uh, when members sit on outside bodies that uh, their uh, business is being run in the, in the standards that it should be, and that's something we're paying more attention to uh, going forward. Happy to take any questions, Chairman. Thanks very much, sir. I notice in some of the boxes, you know, uh, under the heading Chair of Role, uh, there's, uh, it's neither decision maker or advisor. Uh, when will we get clarification of, of these? Thank you, Chairman. I think there are a few where it's blank because, in fact, it's the role of the champion. I'll look at that uh, on page 15 of the committee papers. The first two are blank. It's because they're actually fulfilling the role of a champion. So it's not applicable. It's an internal body at that time, and it's a role rather than a body. So I think that's why it's blank in these occasions. Where there are blanks, uh, we're currently working with uh, these departments, and we would hope to have that information concluded by the end of this year, this calendar year, not financial year. Sorry, Chair. That, that's, that's extremely helpful indeed because, uh, you know, it, it's, you know, particularly in relation, sir, to, to uh, outside bodies uh, and, and where the, uh, the councillor has the role of decision maker, it can be extremely uh, fraught and stressful on occasion. Uh, I think most of us will probably have been there and you're thinking, you know, what have I let myself in for? That, uh, and uh, it's imperative that we get this clarified uh, and, and take it from there. And I think, you know, speaking purely personally, Chair, uh, I think I'll be thinking perhaps uh, more uh, strongly uh, in future as to whether or not I would want to take uh, such appointments than maybe I have done in the past. Just what exactly is the advice then in terms of declarations of interest for all the various components we've now got? If you're an external advisor as opposed to an external decision maker or you're an internal member, what's the difference? I mean, do you, if, you, if, if it's an internal body, for example, Police and Gallery Strategic Partnership, do you declare an interest at that point? If, you're a, if you go to COSLA, which is an external decision-making body, every time we discuss COSLA, do we declare an interest? Then what, what, what's the difference? Because the different, presumably members will get this and, the, the, and they'll see that they will kind of distinguish between the different bodies and then they'll think, well, what, what the heck do I say when it comes to a declaration of interest? There will be sort of a guidance note issued on that. Suggested answers for the following different components or something like that. Thank you, Chairman. I'm again happy for, for Claire to add uh, any value to what I'm about to say, but in simple terms, the advice from the Standards Commission to all members is that if in any doubt, always declare the interest. And that's why what we now do and have done for two or three years at least, at the very start of each uh, meeting in the minutes, you'll see we record any declarations of interest in the minute at the start and also at the item where the member declared the interest. So, in general terms, I would say err on the side of caution and where you have the interest, declare it, and that ensures transparency of the highest level. Uh, in terms of the distinction between uh, declaring the interest and remaining in the room or not, it uh, largely comes down to the nature of that interest and whether or not, in fact, uh, you've already been party to making the decision. So, therefore, the caution would be that if it's an outside body, you wouldn't want to then be in a position where you're again making a decision. Whereas if it's purely uh, uh, a discussion and you believe that your interest is such that you can take part, you declare the interest, but you stay in the meeting. Good example of that, regularly we see members on Swestrans, an outside body, on occasions members will leave, on occasions members will stay. And it's that judgment around the specific business that's being transacted. Claire wants to add anything to that? Um, I think I've covered it nicely there, Derek. It's just... <laughs> I think there's a distinction between registerable interest and non-registerable interest, and you have to make judgments and declarations on both of these. You might have registered an interest with Swestran. Do you feel you'd have to declare that then? And you'd have a situation that a plan application to you know, a relative has got an application in. It's not a registerable interest, but you still have to declare it, and then you'd make the judgment to leave the room. So it's each individual case. You have to look at it and look at the public perception test, which is what the, the ASSA test the standards always say, what would the public say? Um, so it's just a case of getting advice from us and then you know, decision is always with the member at the end of the day. So. I think just on that particular subject, there's, it's defining the difference between a declaration of interest and a conflict. And they're, they're two completely different things. And I think that is kind of absolutely right. That's a test, this is a perception test, as far as the Standards Commission is concerned in terms of humanitarian test could say is, the conflict. Is, is there a conflict there? So no, that's where it really starts then. Is there a conflict in the decision that you're about to make? And that can you remain impartial or will you be drawn towards a certain direction? 
because of that out, outside body. Uh, the, the, the thing, other than that, I mean, I think it's seeing this today. I mean, I've we've got information back to 2007, and we looked at Anvil and Esther, half the outside bodies are men here. Uh, I think that the EI committee, I know I was appointed, it was never changed, far as I'm aware, uh, 100% renewable energy source, uh, re aye, renewable energy source champion. It's not in here either. It really matters. I mean, but I brought it up before, but it's never been updated. I brought it up probably about a year and a half ago now. It wasn't updated for years. But there's a load for Andy and Estill. And it's more about how up to date it is, how relevant are the. Can that's the thing I was hoping to see within this report, how relevant are they to the council? As well as we're obviously we're looking at, but I still say it's, it's, it's a bit more about the conflict of interest than the actual declaration. Because okay? if it's in our declaration of interest, then it should be standard. It's there. It's, you could say that you've actually declared it by putting it in there rather than having to uh, announce it to every committee that, that we walk into. So, I mean, I don't think this is up to date, to be made up to date. I've asked for that here, the committee. Can, so obviously when they get it updated, but I asked for that about a year ago, still haven't had a report back in regards to that. And there is certainly some things uh, missing for it. One of the things that's missing for it, which I'm still not sure about in regards to the process, and uh, it came up at a meeting that uh, Councillor Broad and I were at a couple of weeks ago now, it's how we actually get a, a new outside body formed. How, how does the council, what's the process in regards to the council saying, listen, Ken, this is the process, this is if you want to become an outside body of the council, because one in particular we think is relevant, so that's not contained at the time of the report either. That's the key thing I'd like to see. Yeah, one of the glaring omissions is important one in Andale and Estill is the Annan Master Plan Regeneration Steering Group. We've got the Gretna Master Plan there. But I'm still, I've been on that group for six years. I'm still not, don't know what the status of is. It is it an external body? Is it an outside body? It certainly makes important recommendations to the EIEO Committee on Economic Spending in that in area. Uh, the governance is, I'm not sure about the governance, who's entitled to be a member of that group, how the chairman's elected, why meetings are held in private, which would not normally not be exempt and why commercial conf confidentialities are shared with some businessmen in town and not with others. So concerned about the governance of that one, I don't know if there's any further forward on sort of regulating that. So we've got, we've got a clear, transparent uh, route for that group. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> Understanding you probably see from the uh, scheme before you members, uh, the gaps primarily sit within uh, regeneration, I think. I think that's the, the th conclusion initially in this scheme here, that where there are not uh, names assigned, either decision or um, advisor, uh, and we've certainly had assurance from colleagues uh, within that unit uh, that that will be forthcoming quickly and will update members accordingly. In terms of Council Brothers' point, uh, after potentially being gaps, again, can assure the, the member that we'll speak to him personally to identify what these are and clarify these with colleagues at an area level. Because to give you the confidence, this 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 uh, document needs to be up to date and inclusive. So I can assure you that's our commitment to make sure that that's what we end up with. You said it's on the Island Regeneration Steering Group. It's been coming up for about 20 months ago. There was a report ready to come to council to clarify it. It's not just Annan, it's Lockerbie, it's Dumfries, and it's Renard as well. The re regeneration engagement structures. Uh, we had a liaison meeting with the chief executive. He says there'll be a report forthcoming. I think maybe Derek's aware of that. That'll either come to EI committee or full council. I think it's EI committee, so maybe even Colin could be aware of that as well. But it's because it's the Annan re re Regeneration Steering Group has no links at all to the council, other than that it uses a lot, it uses a lot of its resources. And Richard picks up on a very valid point, being that with private confidential information be shared with cer certain businessmen within the Annan area, the other businessmen in it within the Annan area haven't got links to, haven't got access to that information, and that's quite a criticism to say the least. But there's, there's obviously other things as well, so that really does need to be forthcoming. Just, just an observation, sir. Uh, particularly where, where a member is, uh, you know, is, is representing the council as a, in an advisory capacity, uh, and a number of these outside organisations uh, have experienced it myself. Uh, questions are put to you uh, from time to time. Uh, you know, it's not just looking for advice. Uh, you know, and it, the report mentions, and it's very correct that it does mention there's a danger. You know, uh, you know, in members straying over the bounds or beyond the line of advisor. Uh, our advisory capacity and finishing up in something akin to a decision-making capacity. And I think, you know, that has got, all, well, I'll speak for myself, 
that's obviously got to be always at the forefront of your mind. All I'll say in, uh, in, in defence of the, the members is that you can quite uh, readily and quite easily get sucked into that type of situation, particularly where uh, it's, a, it's a contentious item uh, of business which has been considered by the external organisation in question. Uh, I can think of a couple of uh, cases, a couple of organisations in, uh, in, in the uh, Wickenshire uh, context. I, I won't mention the organisations for obvious reasons, but it is a potential difficulty for people who are put into that position, albeit clearly chair in an advisory capacity. Just offer a comment on that, Chairman. I think the point is well made, and I would certainly hope that where there are these uh, difficult conversations, that the very first person the member should be looking to call on is the link officer, and that's why we want to see more uh, of a relationship between the members on these bodies and the link officers. So therefore, if in fact uh, there is to be more direct advice given, it may be appropriate for the link officer to provide that to ensure that the member is clean from that uh, process. It's maybe in guidance and training for members as well. Mm -hmm. because the member is the council's appointee to that body, whether it be an advisory capacity or a decision-making capacity. And all too often what happens is folk go native and end up being the member for the body they represent rather than the member for the council they're sitting in the body. You know, there's one or two members are very prone to come along to area committee meetings and uh, start arguing for money for certain organisations, and they forget they've got a wider responsibility. Can we move to the, the recommendation? And the first one uh, is detailed in Appendix 1. That's just for noting. Two twos for noting. Two three for noting. Two four for noting. And two five to agree that the link officers complete the questionnaire and the council's involvement. And I think that might lead us on to the, the questions raised by Ian and uh, Richard. It's not a case of including certain bodies, it's may, maybe a case of getting rid of certain bodies. You know, the question's maybe got to be asked, why, why are we there anyway? Maybe we shouldn't be there. So it's a double-edged sword on that one. And 2-6 two, two really covers that. I agree there will be a general assessment of future relationships once the annual assurance process is complete. I just wondered, Chairman, should we get, because there's no reference like the previous one, it goes to full council, but we could get another report coming back here just to get all this. Guys, dot and T's cross. Would that be a fair request? No, no, more than happy. Sorry, more than happy to assure members that will be the next stage. We'll bring this refreshed document back to this committee, and in the meantime, we'll certainly make contact uh, with uh, the members who have raised one or two of these issues and clarify that as soon as possible. Thank you. <laughs> it, it just remind me earlier on the declaration is <laughs> interesting. I remember when the planning committee used to sit in here, no regional council days. There's four charters are there sat in the planning committee, and as soon as one said. Well, I want to declare an interest because this is my client, nudge, nudge, and uh, they leave the room and lo and behold, get granted, next one do the same thing. Uh, I, have, I have been at a council meeting where there was a certain builder was a councillor and uh, he was sitting there and his company was in for a contract and never moved and uh, the council officer said, I think you should declare an interest and put down by the chief executive. So for you to tell him, his conscience. And... Uh, so now we've got rules and regulations there, but in the bad old days, you'll remember them as well, Alistair, there was some, some fairly dubious uh, exercises going on. Anyway, so thank you all very much for your attendance. Going to the Standards Commission and you'll see the case in Borders just a month ago. Uh. <coughs>